Hi, my name is Lorraine Watry and welcome to my studio. I am a watercolor artist and I've worked with watercolor for 26 years now and I thought I would start a new series of videos where I go over different tips, tricks and techniques for working with watercolor and hopefully these short videos will help you in your journey and if you have a question or a technique that you would like to see please comment below and I will try to accommodate that in a future video. Today's tip and trick video is going to be a continuation of the last two videos where I was talking about how to select colors for a painting. And uh, I am now to part of the part of the process where I would actually try out the colors that I have selected and uh, get an idea if they're going to work. So I have a uh, my drawing that I did for a class that I'll be teaching on painting a bee and flower. And, uh, I have, uh, I'm actually using 90 pound arches watercolor paper and I scanned the drawing in on my computer. And then I was able to, in my graphics program, I can lighten, uh, the drawing and then just print it out on my 90 pound paper. Now, I do not use that uh, for anything other than uh, just doing a, a color study or uh, something like that. Um, I always draw uh, with a mechanical pencil on my uh, paper that is 140 pound or 300 pound, either Arches or Fabriano for uh, my, my actual paintings. So this is just a way that I can get uh, the drawing on my paper quickly and do a color study. And uh, it's just something I've come up with that makes the process go a little faster. And the other thing is I use an Epson printer that is, um, I think it's the, let's see, it's the Workforce 47, uh, 4734 and it uses Durabrite ink and Durabrite ink is waterproof. So once I have the drawing printed on here, then I can, uh, paint over it and it's not going to lift, uh, the ink, uh, or blur it. And the 90 pound paper is something that will fit in my printer, but, um, it has a different characteristic than 140 and 300. It may not have as much sizing in it, or it may just be something about the paper that's a little different. And so it's not something I would normally paint on. Now, when I'm looking at an image, I am thinking about things like where are the lightest values? What um, are the colors in those areas? And we're actually going to be uh, for this class. And uh, you might check on my website if you're interested in taking the actual class. Um, but we'll, we'll mask uh, the main flower and start with the background. So for this color study, I'm not going to worry about um, masking anything. I'll just paint around things. So I'm going to start with my lightest values and um, then I'll put in some background. And so actually in, in the actual class, we'll be starting with the background first, but here I'm just going to start with the flower. And when I do a color study, I am not, uh, let's see, my colors right quick are, I want Quin Rose and my hands of light. When I do a color study, I'm not trying to make this perfect. I don't even necessarily finish the color study. Sometimes I'll just get a little bit of it going. And then if everything is looking okay, then I don't necessarily finish it. And so that's probably what's going to happen today. I'm only going to show a part of the process or some of the colors, just so you get an idea of how I might go about it. So in the other two videos, I discussed what to think about when you're looking at your colors and, uh, w you know, what colors you might end up using. Some of it is just trial and error. And some of it is using colors enough that you start to um, get a sense for what colors are going mixes those colors will make. And so I am getting kind of a peachy yellow color here to start and just get some of that on and then I can come back. I want to go a little pinker on parts of it underneath here. So I might uh, do that while it's still damp, but I can always adjust things either in the actual painting. Well, that was um, not what I wanted to do. So I am not 
doing any of this with mask today. So I have to be careful where I'm painting because uh, the colors can run together. So I just need to watch what I'm doing. And the uh, colors that I'm using are colors that I have tested uh, or used previously. So I'm pretty aware of what they can do. And basically I'm kind of making a peachy, peachy pink here. And some of it is pinker than other areas. So I'm going back in between or on some of these areas and going a little pinker. So I'm using the Quin Rose and the Hansa and just varying the mix. Okay, so anywhere that I can leave a white, I will just paint around either a light area or a white area, and I'll just paint around those, like at the very edge of that uh, petal right there. Now flowers can be a little harder to, if you're trying to do a color study for it, just because of all the different petals, and um, you can sometimes paint one color over the whole flower and then come back and make adjustments uh, so that there is some separation of the petals. And But when there's some variation in color, um, like this one has, it's pinker in some areas and then it's uh, peachier in others, then uh, it, it kind of works best if you separate the petals and paint um, just the areas that are those colors. Sorry, stumbling over my words right now, trying to paint and think. Okay, so the center of this flower, which is a zinnia, has a little more of the peachy color, and then the petals that have grown out and are longer are pinker. And this one's a little peachy at the end, and a little pinker as, as it comes in toward the base. All right, uh, so now I'm going to switch and go slightly pinker. All right, and so then I know I want to use the Quinn Rose in a pale manner on uh, the leaves that are, so pale meaning adding water. Um, and then there are shadows in here, but I'm thinking about the first layer. I'm not thinking about with the shadows on them. So that's also a way that I paint is by painting in layers and uh, building so that if there's a lighter, like there's a lighter value on this petal and then there's shadow around it, um, I put that lighter color down and then paint the shadows over it. And so I'm liking that. And this would be the lightest value and then I'll have to let it dry and then I can try adding some shadow to this these petals. Um, in the center of this flower, and I need to do a quick check, just see, it's still slightly damp, but I don't, just cool, actually, it's not even really damp, it's just cool. Um, so in the center of the flower, I'm going to use the rose and a little tiny bit of the Hansa, so it's not, I don't really want a peachy, but there is a lighter uh, part to the center, and then there's darker pinker tips. So and actually I want to go slightly lighter. Now if I were doing a color study and I was either not liking the color or maybe I didn't like some part of it, then I can come back and either do it again completely or just lift the color and try again in that area or um, I could just redo that one section if I feel like I need to know maybe in a landscape, maybe I need to know a little more about how I'm going to paint the sky. So I might just on a separate piece of paper without redrawing my um, painting, I might uh, test out what I would do just for the sky. And you could do these as many times as you feel like it takes for you to get an idea of both the process and the colors that you might be using. So 
and color studies, I feel like are a way that you can, um, try things out, not be concerned about it being perfect. And also, um, just kind of a warm up exercise too. Um, so these are good ways to try, uh, before you get going on your painting. Now, some people can get so lost in doing the color studies that they don't ever, um, get to the actual painting. They just keep thinking, oh, I'm, I don't know enough yet. And so they keep trying, uh, doing a color study or what they might call a color study. And, um, and that's fine. You're still learning. But, um, at some point you just, I feel like you just need to dive in and, um, actually say, okay, this is going to be my painting. I know enough of the information that, um, even if it's not perfect when I'm done, it's, it's one that I'm going to continue and I'm going to finish. Now you could, if you're doing a color study and I'm going to use a little water at the tip of this petal, it gets a little softer and lighter. So I uh, brought my color down to the left side and then used a little water to soften and lighten it. Um, you could do a color study and literally com complete the whole painting like you were going to do the painting. And um, there is nothing wrong with that. When I was first starting uh, watercolor and doing color studies, I have some uh, color studies where I did the whole painting just as a miniature. And, uh, and then what I, what I find though is when I do it again as the actual painting and I do it the size I'm going to do it, it could be a little bigger. It could be the same size even. Um, I, or it could be a lot bigger. Um, I find that doing it the second time that, uh, my process, my colors, my knowledge of the image is a lot better. And I don't always do a full color study anymore. You might hear me say that every now and then in a video. Uh, but I will do some kind of um, mixes or trying of a, a technique or a process for like for right here, this is a little too orange. So I went back and got more of the uh, rose on my brush. Um, but I will try different parts of a painting so that if it's, especially if it's something that I haven't done before, whether it's a new subject or it's a color that I haven't used before, um, or it may just be trying a, a new technique, then it gives me an idea of, uh, what I might be doing before I jump in to do the actual painting. Okay. So then... This one is got some real bright area right in here. So I put on some lighter color right there. I'm going to paint water in the center of that petal and then come back with the rose on this side. And I'm okay with bringing the color a little darker down here because I know that it's going to go that much darker later when I put the shadow over it. So there are times where I go ahead and put the value in as dark as I think it might be. Um, so that is the lighter area. And then this is the darker part of that petal. Um, let's see, I'm getting to a point, actually I can do that one right there. And because I have not masked, um, I may miss some of the highlights, uh, but for this kind of thing, I'm not worried about that. It is nice to have those bright areas on your painting though. And okay, so that's yellow. And then I'll use a little water over on this side. And I could have put that on first as well before I put the paint on. And I'll do a little more and then I'll put in some of the background color So normally if I'm painting a color study, I don't try to go this fast with it either. Um, I just take my time and enjoy the process and sometimes I will take notes. So if I have not uh, done some colors, color swatches, I may just try colors right on the color study 
and uh, then I would just write on my tape or the edge of the paper where the paint is uh, what those colors are that I'm using. And I'm going to come around right in here with a little bit of the peachier color. And there is one in front of it. So right now, all of this is pretty much the same value. There's a little bit of value change. Uh, but again, I'm not concerned about that because it's, uh, at this stage, it's just first layers. And if I were uh, doing this as my color study and not filming it and all, all of that, I would uh, make sure I was taking time in between the shapes to make sure they were dry. So I might take out a blow dryer and dry it right quick before doing this petal. And um, just doing the process like I might do for an actual painting. All right, so I think, well, I mean, I feel like I need to get a little more on here. So let's get this one in. And I'll check, I'll probably pull out the blow dryer here in a second because that will speed this up. And this does give me an idea as I start to get this filled in and I'm looking back and forth at the image and just trying to decide, am I liking the colors? And um, I may, uh, if I were doing this uh, for my painting, then I may only, like I said, I may only um, finish or add more layers to one part of it. I may not finish the whole thing. So it is a, it is really kind of up to you how much of this you might complete. And this is uh, so far been on dry paper. I haven't pre-wet um, and done anything wet on wet. And the background will be wet on wet though. Okay, so I'm going to dry this. So I will pause and I'll be right back. I have dried uh, where I was working and I'm going to go in trying to decide if I want to add. I may try a little bit of Quinn Lilac with the Quinn Rose for those little uh, darker areas on the center. And because this is not something that I had made a mix for, and I'm not trying to make this exactly like what it's showing on the image right now, I'm just trying to put it in quickly. Um, but because I had not uh, tried that mix on my test strip here, then it's something that I would take a pen and just write something like center, whoops, cent okay, that pen's not going to work. Okay, so that was not working, so I'm gonna grab my other pen. Okay, so center, and then I would use like Quinn Lilac and Quinn Rose Mix, and just make a note to myself. And uh, the pen I was just using, it's a Uniball Vision Needle. And this is also what I use when I'm doing my uh, drawings. Uh, when I have drawn the drawing in, in pencil, then I re-ink it with the Uniball so that it's dark enough. So that's kind of like a first layer. One of the things about the 90 pound paper is it takes more paint to um, make it have a little, be a little more vibrant. So I think you might be able to tell a difference here. Also, this is, I think this is maybe Fabriano. Um, and it is a brighter paper, first of all, but uh, the colors on it are nice and vibrant. And I find when I do the, use the 90 pound, it's just not as vibrant as if I were using uh, 140 or 300. Okay, so I have um, that, kind of that first layer on 
the uh, flower. And so then I want to test my background and sort of my process. So I'm not going to do the whole background, but I'll do this left side. And I have, I'm going to get out some rows, get out some more of the hands of light and maybe some new gamboge. And then my greens that I made mixes for, I'm going to use, I'll pull out some sap green because I'm not sure if I'll end up wanting that, but I'll have it out. And then I will get out cobalt and oriolan, and I have the new gamboge out already. So I tend to, I do a lot of mixing of greens, so I'll use cobalt and uh yellows or I'll use ultramarine and yellows and um, I have mostly warmer greens on my palette that are tube greens so I have sap I have green appetite genuine I have serpentine and I have green gold and green gold is hardly ever used it is a very vibrant color but it's nice to have when I want it and then my other or my cool green that I have is ultramarine turquoise so I don't have hookers I don't have viridian I don't have some of those cooler greens uh, that other artists might like. I tend to like to make those myself. Um, you can use thalo and some of the yellows to make cooler greens. Um, and the ultramarine turquoise is a beautiful kind of uh, sea green type of color. And it, it mixes really well with things as well. So I like to have those warmer greens kind of is a convenience really because I can mix the warmer greens as well. You just maybe can't get it quite as vibrant for some mixes. Okay, so I have Oriolan. I have Hands of Light. I have New Gamboge. Those are my three yellows. I already had, um, I think that's Oriolan that's sitting here and I uh, already had that out. But uh, And then I have my Cobalt. So I can do a variety of mixes. I also have my pinks out because there is a flower up in here that is blurry in the background. And like I said, I'm not going to do the whole thing, but I want to have um, this edge up here be blurry and it would be part of the process. So, And then because this is not masked, I'm just going to come kind of close to those edges and I'm putting water out farther than where I want or where I will be painting. I actually have a little bit of yellow on my brush. That's all right. And then I'm just coming close. I don't typically uh, paint right up to the line with my water unless I have the time to do that. If it's a very detailed edge that I'm going around, I will usually just come close and then use the paint to come right up to the edge because with the paint I can see what I'm doing better and then I don't have to be as careful. All right, so close enough around that left side. Now, um, depending on how big your shape is, uh, this paper is different than what I usually paint on, so I do not know if it's going to be drying before I get down and around this edge, so I just have to kind of watch for that. Um, and then that top section, like I said, is a mix of pink and kind of a peachy color. I'm seeing a little bit of peach kind of right in here, maybe some right there. And then it pretty quickly goes into the pinks over in here. Maybe a little more right there. And because I'm not trying to paint this whole thing right now, um, this it might look a little funny with it going off that edge over there. And um, yeah, I want to have that soft edge, so then I'm going to go right into my greens. And let's see. 
I want it a little cooler and I'm going to dry the back of my brush because I don't want too much moisture as I touch on here. And this is a little vibrant. So I want to mute this green a little bit and I have my Quinn Lilac sitting on my palette. So I made the green and then I just came and touched right into that red and it mutes that green. It makes it less vibrant and then um, I'm feeling like it's matching what I'm seeing on the image a little better. Now I am not cleaning my brush right now because I want to make sure I have enough time to get around this shape and generally when you do that, when you don't clean your brush, um, you get a little blending of color. And for this, it's fine because it's in the background and those greens can kind of blur and kind of blend into each other anyway. Back of the bee and around the wings. And there's a tip of petal right there. Okay, and then so you can see when I have the paint on my brush, I can see what I'm doing better than if I am trying to use the water solely to go around those shapes. Now, like I said, I do kind of come close, but I don't necessarily touch the shape that is there. Okay. And then around on the left side over here, there is an area that is darker and I'm using the cobalt and the Quinn Lilac. It's kind of a purpley green. So I had the green on my brush still. This is a muted mix. It almost goes to brown. And I am, I do have a lot of different pigments on the brush right now. So this may end up being kind of blah instead of just a nice muted color. Um, so I need to go get, if you get too many colors in the mix, you can end up having it, um, like I said, kind of look muddy or blah. Not real. Yeah. Muddy. Correcting myself here. Okay. So came around there and then as I'm coming down, so I'm changing and just because it's in my image, whoops, that way, does not mean I have to do exactly what the image is showing me. So I had a little more of the cobalt in my brush and I like that bluer passage there. Uh, and then as it comes down, it's kind of a muted yellowy green. So I'll probably change and make some of that just to have some similarity, but if it doesn't, whoop, I had a lot of blue on my brush still. Like I said, if it doesn't match exactly, that's okay. It's just more about having some variety. Now, if you're doing a painting where you love that mix and you love those colors, then um, I would take some time to figure out what exactly you want to use. And um, it might be trail. Uh, just doing lots of color swatches to get where you like the color. Okay, now as I come down, this is dry down here. Even though it's kind of cool to the touch, there's no more water on the paper down there. So instead of continuing to go around the painting over there in the background, I'm just going to use a little water to blur that side. Um, now I do have to be careful with this though because... Uh, that water is, uh, if it's a lot wetter, is going to cause a bloom. And I am getting just a little bit of a bloom edge right in there, which is not always bad in a background because sometimes that makes an interesting texture and it can look like um, edges of an item or an object or it can look like bokeh where you get kind of a soft blurry edge. Um, okay, so I'm going to go back. Um, that gives me an idea of background color and I'm liking those okay. Uh, I'm going to go back into some of this and then I'll do just a touch on the B. So I know on these guys that they do go uh, darker with shadow and so I'm using Quinrose and a touch of the cobalt in there 
and I'm going to use a little more rose in the mix. And then leave, um, I'm leaving the highlights this time. So where I painted the color on in the beginning, that first layer is now my highlighted area on these petals. And I probably painted it, uh, I did paint it in uh, too dark, that first layer, um, because it's pretty highlighted over here. So once this is on, I'll be able to see better, but um, yeah, it's probably just a touch too much color on that first layer. And I want, there's a little blue on the tip of this petal. It's just slightly purpler. So I went back and got a little bit of cobalt on my brush while it's uh, still damp in that area and added that. Um, let's see. I'm going to trying to again kind of move this along a little bit and get some darker values going in here just so it's easier to see. That's uh, part of the stem. I'll do this uh, petal right there. More rose and a touch of the cobalt. And I went over, okay, I'm going to move the highlight over. There's a highlight on this petal where the light is catching it. And again, my first layer was probably a little too dark. Now, sometimes with highlights like those, I won't even put color on them. Sometimes I'll just leave uh, that, like right in here, this is doesn't have any color on it. Um, sometimes I'll just leave them like a white on the object. So it really kind of depends on how light or dark an area feels to you, but you can just leave a highlight without color. And I can go back and lift as well. I probably won't try it on this paper because uh, it, it doesn't handle scrubbing. That's the other thing about the 90 pound. It's handy for some purposes, but not for doing an actual painting, I think. Okay, so just kind of darkening some of these to separate some of the edges and just give some more um, depth. Now, this is also what I would be doing in an actual painting, but slower, um, to go in after I've done that first layer, come back and start um, looking for areas where I can add more layers and increase the values and start separating the parts of the shapes. Okay, there's some pink in here. And uh, I'm going to come back to, let's see, Quinn Lilac. Quinn Rose. See if I can get this to go a little stronger. It also feels like sometimes when I come back on this paper with another layer, sometimes it will retain some of the vibrancy that it doesn't if I just do a layer or two. Okay. Now it may not stay that way because as it dries, it does get less vibrant. Um, So if you're using a student grade brand of paper, you might also notice that uh, when you paint on it, things don't feel as vibrant um, and you might try a different brand of paper. And I really like Arches and Fabriano. And I use um, the sheets of arches. I don't use, oh, sometimes I'll use the block, but uh, I don't use the tablet of arches. Uh, I've had some students try it and I just felt like uh, it wasn't as good as the sheet. And supposedly it's made the same, but I'm not positive. I don't know if there's some difference in the sizing 
but it is less expensive and I do understand that sometimes you have to go with that. Um, but yeah, if it, paper is really important in watercolor. It can really make a big difference. Okay, so coming around and now I'm going to go in with some darks. Um, so in underneath these petals, there are some really dark areas where those shadows can really help make these petals feel like they're uh, light and vibrant. And um, I think I'll use ultramarine and quen rose and a touch of yellow with it. So I'll make a purple and I don't have any yellow out. I want to use my warmer yellow is why I do have some yellow out, but So this is New Gamboge. So I've got a little bit of the New Gamboge in my purple. It mutes it, makes it um, not as vibrant a purple. And I'm just going to use that here, even though it's really kind of a deep dark green, just to kind of separate that. And again, this is early, this would be done later because I'd want to make sure that I had kind of those layers in where I want them before I would start putting this on. But it just gives me a way to try it and see if that's going to help. And there is a shadow on this petal at the back and another shadow right here. And then the front shadow where I already started to darken it a little bit, um, I can use some water right along that edge. And then when I bring my color down and then touch next to the water, it's going to give me that soft edge again. And that darker value helps to um, make it feel like it's more in shadow. Um, one of the things I'll go ahead and do is a little bit of color on the bee just to get an idea. And uh, I was going to use my Burnt Umber and ultramarine for parts of the bee. Um, actually, I want to use my, let's see if I have my other brush available. I don't know what I did with them. All right, I'll use this one. <laughs> Jeez. Okay, so I'm going to use some burnt umber with a tiny touch of the new gamboge for a warm brown because this hum a uh, hummingbird this bumblebee is um a little muted on this image so you're not seeing the bright uh, yellow that you might on in some lighting situations I'm just going to put some of that lighter value on first. Again, looking for the lighter values, and I'm not worried about the wings right now. And up along the kind of the shoulder area of the bee, the front, there's a darker value, and that's the burnt umber and ultramarine. And I'm going around his eye. I could paint where the eye is, but it helps remind me that there is an eye in there and that um, where it is, and then I can come back later and darken it. Put that darker value on. Now the wings, I'm going to actually use some of that um, blue 
kind of muted mix that I had out earlier. Um, really can depend on the wings, what the light is doing. You can have some color from the area around it. I'm going to leave some lighter edges for the wings. So kind of a blue gray. And sometimes you'll see color. So they might have some green in them, depending on, you know, if it's over a green area. In fact, it does have just a touch of green. We'll get a little bit of sap. Put a little bit of that in there. So just leaving a few lighter areas in there will help those wings feel like they're kind of shiny. And um, I think I'll dry that right quick. I'll be right back. All right, I have that dry and I am going to go in with some darker value for the legs and parts of the uh, head of the bee. And I'm pulling out ultramarine and the burnt umber. I'm going to make a, what I consider sort of a near black. It's not quite all the way black, but for some of those darker areas, they're not really black anyway. And let's see. But it looks pretty close, especially in small quantities. And there's a part right in here that comes around. And I'm trying to see where the leg is because I kind of painted over it. It comes down into here. And then there's another leg area right there. And the leg behind and these mandibles are right in here. Her mandibles, actually, I should say. I had a nice um, contact from someone who has seen my Instagram page and I was showing, I think it was Instagram. Oh no, it was my newsletter. So I have a, a newsletter and she uh, keeps bees. And so she was sending me information about bees and I thought that was great. Um, all right. And I already knew the females were the workers, but I always forget and I tend to call them he and Okay, and then the uh, wing has a darker edge that connects right into here. And I need to darken the area up on the shoulder again. Sorry, started to say that and then got caught up in what I was doing. Okay. Uh, so it's not, uh, it's not perfect. It's kind of very rough, but it gives me an idea of if the colors will work. I feel like I want to push it a little yellower in the yellow part. So even though it's not uh, showing on the image, that I have uh, that way. I don't know where, why the light, um, it may be, oh, I combined a couple images of mine. So um, it may just be that where I took the one image wasn't quite as um, bright a light. So um, increasing the value and that doing the color study helps me to see, and I had had that idea of I might do that and doing the color study helps me to see that yes, I want to do that. I want to add a little more yellow to the bee and 
make sure he's vibrant. She's vibrant. Okay. And then under here, I just need to kind of fill that in with some pink to make it look like the bee is actually on the uh, center of the flower. Okay, and then um, there is yellow. There are yellow um, parts to the zinnia and I don't know if those are stamen or if it's just a part of the the flower and those kind of curl and come in around the outside part of the center. Now on this, um, I would actually need to come back and do more uh, with the values and, uh, you know, really tighten all of this up because it's very, uh, it doesn't have the depth right now. It doesn't have the values it needs. And uh, so if I were going to do this as my actual painting, there is a lot more that I would need to do. But this gives me an idea if I'm liking the colors, if they're close enough to what I want to use from the photo and uh give me an idea of it if it's working and um there and again i could continue i could do all of the layers and make it a really complete painting but that gives uh you an idea of what a color study can look like and that it can be a quick um, way to test your colors and get an idea if they're working. Now, if I, like I said, if, if I was doing this and I wasn't caring for what was happening, then I could either redraw or I could reprint it uh, in my case and try again. Um, I do not have to follow the colors in my image. So what some artists will do is they will, uh, print their image in black and white, and then they create their colors, uh, from things that they want to use and not be um, totally slave to what the image is showing them. So whenever you're working with an image, whether it's uh, on location or you are painting in your studio from a photograph, try different color mixes, try making um, some a change to it. So uh, like I did for the bee, I want the bee to be a little uh, yellower. And so trying it on the color study gives me that sense of, yes, I want to do that. So um, I hope this was helpful and that uh, the series kind of gave you some ideas of how to think about uh, picking colors and uh, what to think about when doing them uh, in uh, for your painting. So if you have a tip, trick, or technique that you might like to see in a video, please leave a comment below and I will add it to my list. And um, I will see you in the next one. Thanks. Bye.